Well, today we're going to be talking about an issue that uh, is not dealt with that much, actually, uh, and it's not hard to understand why. Uh, the topic that, you know, Jesus is going to next, because again, we're right in the middle of the Sermon on the Mount, Sermon on the Mount, and, and he's dealing with all these issues, right? And the topic now that he's going to get into is the topic of sexuality and lust and adultery. Remember last week it was anger? That was fun, right? Um, they're all different issues that he, he gets to in this sermon, and yet they're all really important. They're all really, really relevant, and they're very, very practical for us. Now, I feel like I need to make a few disclaimers here. I got three disclaimers. One, I am not excited to talk about this. I mean, just, just throwing it out there. Honestly, I'm, I'm kind of sweating already. This is not something I, I really am excited to preach about, and yet it, it is an issue that the Scriptures talk a lot about, and so we just can't avoid it just because it's not popular or maybe it's uncomfortable. Uh, the second disclaimer, um, I don't really care about my opinion on this, <laughs> okay? Uh, and I, I really don't actually want you to carry about, care about my opinion. And frankly, this might sound harsh, but I really don't care about your opinion either, okay? What I, what I really want is for all of us to care about what God says, right? And what His opinion is, because He's pretty clear. It's not really a mystery. And so, you might not like what I'm going to say today. You might, might find it hard to listen to. You might, not, you might want to throw something at me, but please understand that I'm just trying to, to, to say what God is saying here, and, and so take it up with Him, right? The thing is, that the issue is, is that it's easy for us to make our decisions and evaluations about life based on what society says and based on what the, our feelings say. I'm not interested in that. That's opinion stuff. I'm very much interested in what God says just because he's way smarter than all of us. And he, he's got this figured out pretty good. And three, I'm not standing up here in a place of judgment or condemnation. Here's the deal. I think this is probably going to hit us all, right? I'm pretty sure of that. So please hear my heart this morning as we get into this issue. I'm not coming at you at all, okay? I'm sitting there actually right next to you, okay? I, we're, we are all sitting under the word of God receiving what he says, and so this is not a, a judgment or a shame thing or a condemnation thing. And so my hope in my prayer is that as the Spirit of God takes his word that he has given to us, that we would all then, every one of us, myself included, would listen and receive and seek him all the more in a very relevant issue. The text today again is in Matthew 5. This is following after last week on anger. And he's starting with that familiar structure. You have heard that it was said, you shall not commit adultery. But I say to you that everyone who looks at a woman with lustful intent has already committed adultery with her in his heart. If your right eye causes you to sin, tear it out and throw it away. For it is better that you lose one of your members than that your whole body be thrown into hell. And if your right hand causes you to sin, cut it off and throw it away. For it is better that you lose one of your members than your whole body go into hell. You know, as we hear those verses, it, it kind of sets us back a little bit, doesn't it? You know, there, there are just some of those verses in the Bible that's just like a punch to the gut. <laughs> you, you hear them and you're like, whoa, it just sort of knocks you. This is one of those. Our plan today is this. So we're going we're gonna to seek to understand sexuality, understand lust, and understand then the way forward. That, that's key. All right, understanding sexuality. Here's the deal. I think, I think we, and what I bet, when I say we, I'm just generalizing the church, Right? Uh, don't spend enough time in really understanding the beauty and the gift of sexuality. And as a result, we kind of we kind of go into our little shell and we allow society to sort of corner the market on this. And as a result, when this topic comes up, we get all negative and we get all weird and 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 without any really foundation of understanding why there's a problem, we we just we don't do anything right with it. And consequently, then, we aren't able to make a case to ourselves or to others why God's way is the best way. Now, before we get into our text here, what I want to do is I want to spend some time getting to the heart of sexuality by contrasting the cultural view or societal view of sexuality with what the Bible says, with what God says, because there's a huge difference and there's just a ton of confusion about it. Cultural view. We see that our culture is highly, highly sexualized, okay? And it's kind of the things that just drives industry. And I, and I think there's two reasons why. I'm going to try to, there we go, behind, there we go. The first reason is that our societal understanding of sexuality is purely a physicalization of sexuality. 
uh, sexuality in our culture has been reduced to something purely physical. It is the exchange of pleasure, a, a biological function. It is the satisfying of a physical urge, physiological thing. It's a, it's a recreational issue. And this idea is literally everywhere, and it shapes entertainment, it shapes movies, it shapes TV shows, it shapes halftime shows, things like that, right? It, it portrays sexuality as just no big deal. It's just something you do. It's very common, right? And, and that's just normal, right? You have, a, you have a hook up there, and you have a hook up there, you have a hook up there, you have a hook up there. What culture believes is that you can actually separate the physical action from any sort of emotional or personal connection, or another way. We can separate physical intimacy without any sort of emotional intimacy. That's what our culture believes and teaches. And this is the view that is so prevalent, and it is so widely accepted as normal today. And that did not just happen overnight, right? Now, one of the ways to test ideas is to see the consequences of ideas, right? So has, has the liberation of any bounds and any restraints on sexuality or the physicalization of sexuality, has that had a positive effect in our world? Or maybe I can ask it another way. Is there any evidence in our society that the modern view that saturates our culture is creating more honor and respect for men and women? Is there any evidence that is saying that our modern view is creating a better home environment for children to be loved and cared for and raised? Or, or how about the idea of, is it creating a diminished loneliness and more happiness? Well, see, the irony of this whole thing is that it's a total house of cards, both physically and psychologically. I mean, it's not hard to see all the physical consequences here, right? STDs, unwanted pregnancies, abortion, just the hardship on families, the pornography industry, which makes more money than the NFL, NBA, and the MLB combined, right? Or sex trafficking, with a large portion of what I just said, causing all kinds of social and medical issues, creating more poverty issues, creating higher tax issues, and on and on and on. The, the whole, I can do whatever, what, whatever I want as long as it doesn't hurt someone else, is just a naive and superficial ethic. What about the psychological consequences? Because the dirty little secret is, as much as our society tries to just beat into our minds that sexuality is simply physical, simply biological, that does not change reality. That, that sexuality actually engages the whole person, it engages our emotions and our, and our minds. And the science actually backs this up. It's not even like arguable. Continually discovering these sort of chemical reactions and bonds that take place during intimacy. There's a ton of research relating to the psychological state that happens within sexuality within a man and a woman. And, and then research then consequently is showing the, the rise in the abuse of drugs and alcohol and antidepressants when relationships are seen purely as a physical thing. There's a professor of philosophy at a major university who uh, wrote an article just talking about how has the hookup culture, uh, what is it doing to our women? And she said this, that the top two prescribed drugs from the University Health Center are antidepre antidepressants and birth control pill. And those two are related. Why? Because, the more, because we are more than physical bodies. We are body and soul. We are people with emotions and with mental health and with desires. And so as a result, this hookup culture, it actually dehumanizes people. It is not producing freedom. It is not producing happiness, but what it is actually doing is producing bondage emotionally and spiritually and mentally and, and physically. So that's the first thing that we see in our society. The second aspect, which is related, is the consumerization of it. Clearly this con connects to the first one because if sexuality is simply just a physical thing, then it can be turned into a consumer product, right? Anything goes with anyone. Hookup culture. There's even apps for this. So then this plays out in our consumeristic relationships. And, and the only people that are harmed are those that are around us, our, our families. So our, the modern view, guys, that in society of sexuality, which claims to be so positive, so liberating, so modern, really when you strip all the pomp and circumstance away, has one of the most negative views of men and women that there is. And it just literally robs sexuality of the profound reality that it is, leaving only in its wake disappointment, frustration, loneliness, and pain. So, so what's the biblical view? Man, it's really interesting. Most people think that the Bible has a negative view of sexuality. Maybe you guys think that. I don't know. Uh, or or maybe, more, maybe the Bible has a negative view of sexual desire. 
Or, or they think, uh, you know, well, this isn't appropriate to talk about. We should never talk about it, right? It doesn't put butts in the seats. Some even think that it's sinful. <laughs> or that, no, that, that only exists because God wants to procreate. And to be fair, I think the church is to blame for this. Because we just avoid this issue like the plague. Our silence is very loud. But here's the deal. The Bible has a ton to say on this, which makes sense since God made it. I mean, remember how the Bible starts? It starts with Adam and Eve, naked, right? <laughs> In fact, for, for those that think that the Bible has a negative view of sexuality or, or, or has saying that sexual desire is bad, they, they are betraying the fact that they have not read the Bible because we could literally spend hours and hours and hours and hours looking at verses that would flat out make you blush and get really, really awkward. <laughs> no, the, the Bible is extremely pro-sexuality and pro-sexual desire. Uh, we are the ones to blame for getting all prudish about it. Now, let me, let me start to compare this with an illustration. Fire, right? Fire. Fire is one of the great discoveries of mankind. You, you put fire in a fire pit and it makes heat. It's wonderful, right? You, you put fire in, in a lantern and it gives light, right? So you can see things. It, it, it gives warmth. It makes heat. You put it in a stove and, and you can cook things with it, right? And we can think of all the amazing things that we use fire for. Now imagine fire in the wrong place. A fire started in the middle of a dry forest. Fire started in the middle of your living room. <laughs> fire right next to your window with curtains. Right? That kind of freaks us out because we all know that fire outside of where it belongs only causes damage. And yet inside of where it belongs is one of the greatest things that there is. You see, sexuality is the same. Let it thrive where it belongs. It's the greatest gift there is. Let it outside of where it belongs and it's only going to cause ruin. Let's consider the biblical sexuality then in all of its glory. The Bible speaks about sexuality as a gift of God, that the pleasure is good, we're, we're built for it. That gift is to be unleashed then within that covenant relationship, marriage, where a man and a woman promise to one another their whole life, everything that they are, their whole self, where everything that they are is the others. There's this deep covenant commitment there. Note again, uh, we talked about marriage a few months ago when we were in our origin series, and we talked about the contrast between a covenant marriage a relationship and a consumer relationship. Again, a consumer relationship is all about me getting my needs met in a certain agreed-upon price, but once that changes, then I'm going to move on to something else because it's just, it's just not good anymore. And, and so then we see how sexuality becomes this perfect consumer product. Th that's not the biblical sec sexual ethic. Sexuality is not a consumer product. It is a covenant product to be enjoyed in a covenant commitment. Tim Keller, he's written the best book on marriage. It is so good. I can recommend it to you if you're interested in it. Uh, it's, he speaks about sexuality in almost a sacramental kind of a way, sort of this outward action of this very deep, invisible reality, right? And he talks about how sexuality within a covenant marriage is the outward vehicle of giving the entire self. And it is because my life and my person is covenanted to the other that I am giving myself outwardly. Covenant sexuality means that I am giving myself wholly to the other person, and that is including all things. I'm opening myself up holistically. I, everything, it's, it's yours. In the Hebrew word for sexuality, sexual practice in Scripture, it literally means... The mingling of souls, united in body and soul. So please, let, let's flip this over then. Because Keller draws this conclusion, and I think he is totally spot on with this, and I think it really makes sense. And so then when we engage in sexual activity outside of the design of this covenant of marriage, we are asking someone to do with their body what they are not willing to do with their whole life. Man. Sexuality within the covenant is whole life vulnerability. It is a giving. It is freedom. And I know this is so countercultural and perhaps it's hard to hear. And yet, friends, this is the most positive and most beautiful description of sexuality that there is. The biblical view of sexuality is, is elevated to the grandest place. It is a gift to be designed, which actually creates freedom and flourishment when it's placed in the right framework. All right, so 
as we jump into our text, yeah, that's just the intro. Please understand that nothing that we're going to read here makes any sense unless we really understand God's incredibly high view of sexuality, not the degrading, superficial, consumeristic one that is peddled in our society. All right, let's get into the text. Understanding lust. Jesus says, You have heard that it was said, You shall not commit adultery, but I say to you that everyone who looks at a man with lustful intent has already committed adultery with her in his heart. All right, again, that kind of familiar phrase we talked about last week, you have heard that it was said. And each of these sections started out that way. He, he is jumping into an accepted belief. And what, what is that? It, it's the commandment, right? You shall not commit adultery. Uh, that's clear. That's a good thing, right? Uh, Bible, the Bible defines adultery of any, as any sexual... Um, is any sexuality outside of the covenant of marriage? That's just what the Bible says, for good reason. We just kind of covered that. So the context here, again, he's, he's battling this external type of righteousness. He is battling people that think, hey, if I'm just good on the outside, then I'm fine. And he's trying to dive into the heart, right? Helping the disciples and, and all of us then seek after internal righteousness, that which the Spirit of God is going to do in our hearts. He's dealing with heart issues here. Now at this point, the crowd would have understood this, and said, yeah, absolutely, thou shalt not commit adultery. But now Jesus is going to dive deep, and he's going to throw them a curveball, and he's going to sort of unlock the heart of the commandment. And he goes far beyond external matters, right? And he deals with this issue of lust. But I say to you, everyone who looks at a woman with lustful intent has already committed adultery in his heart. Oh boy, you can imagine all these disciples at that moment just kind of going like that, right? Lowering their head, it just got really real. And now unfortunately... This text has been used by people in and out of the church to say that sexual desire is bad. We just kind of covered that. Or that admiring beauty is bad. They think Jesus is saying, well, if you have any sort of sexual desire, H-E double toothpicks, H-E double toothpicks, right? That's where you're going to go. But we need to see this within the context. He, He is not saying sexual desire within covenant marriage is bad. In fact, that's a good thing. It's a beautiful thing. You should have righteous sexual desire for your spouse, Right? It's designed to be that way. But please note, he says, whoever lusts at a woman with intent. So it seems, you know, here that Jesus is going after men, and for good reason, because it's easier for men to physicalize this whole thing, but clearly the commandment is, is for all. This is equal opportunity here. Women can lust after men just as badly. In fact, the fastest growing percentages of viewers of pornography are women. You should read the statistics. It will shock you. Unbelievable. The word and the idea here goes right to the heart, and it's 100% negative, lust. And that word in the original speaks of a negative, unleashed desire, a desire that is misplaced, a desire that is wrongly focused, not the right thing. It has greed and it has idolatry. That's kind of part of it. So this captures the idea of desiring something that is not yours for selfish reasons. It it is like a sinful fantasy. It is a looking to something, hoping that they're going to meet these needs that I have. It is a greed. It is a heart of lust. It is turning something of beauty into an idol to use it selfishly, to desire intently what simply isn't mine. Please note, friends, that lust is not the first look. Lust is not the recognition of beauty. Lust is not the observation, but it's what we do with the second look. Okay? There's a distinction there. What do I do with what I just saw? Am I obsessing about it? Am I desiring it? Or am I just praising God? Man, that's nice. Praise God for his creative work. I'll leave that there. Jesus is saying... (laughs) Jesus is saying that this lustful intent is located in the heart. And that sinful desire that rages up, it desires to possess and to take and to have. And so so men and women, when, when lust rises in our hearts, what it does is that it takes the beauty of humanity and it reduces that person to a consumer good and to something that I need. What it does is it dehumanizes and it degrades that person. And this sinful desire then is everything that the Bible says real sexuality is not. One is beautiful. One is an incredible gift. The other one is worship and idolatry, which ultimately destroys it. It's like fire. One is ultimately beautiful in the right place, and outside of that, it's deeply dangerous. Now, friends, why is this a bad thing? Our culture says this isn't a big deal. Don't worry about this. In fact, it almost intentionally tries to produce it. 
from everything within our movies and magazines and novels and on and on and on. The irony, though, of this desire that is so much trying to be compelled in our society is that the real-life consequences just don't line up. By, by allowing lust to grow, by, by allowing lust to take over us, what it does is that it leads to entrapment. It is 100% selfish. And if we are involved in something that is 100% selfish, guess what? That's going to impact our lives and the lives around us. Let's just take pornography, for example. That's the most pressing and most obvious issue. There are so many studies that are coming out right now outside of anything religious, inside of religious things, and they're all coming to the same conclusions. Here's a few of them. These are the effects. It causes men and women to see each other as objects, obviously. It results in lower self-esteem. It leads to abuse of women. It lowers the moral values of individuals in society. <laughs> it isolates sexual fulfillment from a caring relationship. People aren't getting married now because they can just have their computer. It exploits young women's naivety and need for money and for men too. It is linked to crimes of rape and trafficking and abuse of kids. It is increasingly controlled by organized crime and it is psychologically addictive. It is brain altering. These are things that are, that are happening today because of this. So even just taking this very one simple aspect regarding of lust here, consider the, the victims. Who are the victims? Those that are performing. Consider all the traffic trafficking industry, those who view and become addicted despite all their shame, the husbands and the wives who suffer isolation and shame and, and assault, the children then who are abused, and the society then that bears the cumulative pain because of family units that are being destroyed and crime and disorder. The point I'm making, guys, is that the abuse of sexuality, the, the unleashing of lust, is not a neutral thing. If we allow it to grow and control, it is not a moral virtue. That's not what happens. It, is not, it doesn't produce anything positive. It ruins people. It is not something that, well, this is just my private life. It, it's not something, oh, you know, don't worry about it. I can ignore it. I can handle it. Because in our heart, in our society, it only has a negative result, and that is pain, abuse, depression, disease, darkness, and on and on and on and on. Not only does it have obvious consequences in our world, but think about what it does in our spiritual life. As we lust, or any other sin for that matter, right? As we let that have its way, what we are doing is we are accepting and we are thinking, hey, this is okay. No big deal. And the result is, is that we are hardening our heart where we are pushing God off and we are basically saying, you know what, God, I've got this figured out. I, I know this better than you do. I got this. I don't need to listen to you. The problem, of course, is that it doesn't just stay there. Because if, if we're reacting to God in that way, we're going to react to God in other ways. And that hardening then leads to hardening in other areas. And that rejection then leads to rejection in other areas. And finally, be, because we, we never really wanted to come under the authority of the Lord, we never really wanted to deal with our sin, that has co tragic consequences today and eternally. Whew. How about our way forward? If your right eye causes you to sin... Tear it out and throw it away. For it is better that you lose one of your members than that your whole body be thrown into hell. And if your right hand causes you to sin, cut it off and throw it away. For it is better that you lose one of your members than that your whole body go into hell. Now, some people take this literalistically and say, out with the eye, out with the hand, right? That's not what Jesus is getting at here. He, he's giving us a little bit of hyperbole. And, and why do I think that? And why did, why did people basically in general believe this? Because removing an eye and removing a hand isn't going to stop your heart from lusting, right? I mean, many actually have tried this. You look at all the, you know, in church history, right? They have tried to blind themselves, and they've tried to isolate themselves, but the problem is that you can never set yourself free from your own mind and heart. So clearly this is talking about hyperbole. The point here is that he's making is that this is such a serious issue that you have to be willing to make drastic behavioral decisions so that you are not destroyed by sexual idolatry. That's part of the way forward. I got three things here. First, recognize this is a very serious issue. That's the first step, right? To recognize, man, this, this is not good. This, will, this is going to destroy me. I hope you've seen that today. And if you struggle with this, and, and honestly, guys, we are all in the same boat here. We all deal with this in one level or another. And I hope we all see, man, this is just not God's way for us. This is not the best way. This is sinful and it's not good. 
The second aspect is be willing to make radical changes. That's kind of what Jesus is getting at to here. What do we need to do to get sexual idolatry out of our life? What do we need to do to fight for purity? Because if we don't fight for it, it's going to consume us. So men and women, I can't tell you what that means for you. Everyone is different here. The issue comes at each of us very, very differently. And Satan wants to tear us to shreds, all of us, in different ways. And he knows your weakness, and he's going to try to exploit that. So my, my methods might be different than yours, and that's okay. Ask this of yourself, though. What are the conditions in my life, what are the circumstances in my life that seem to, be, that seem to happen when I'm most tempted in this area? Is it a computer issue, a TV issue, a phone issue, a novel issue, a coworker work issue? Is it going to the gym issue? I mean, honestly, there's a ton of ways in which this issue just, boom, flares up. So the question then is, what radical decisions do I need to make for me to fight this? For me to be serious about it? And third, eyes on Christ. And this is, this is the key to victory. Because there's, there's no way forward unless we, have to leave our, unless we leave our past to Jesus. Okay? We can't go forward unless Jesus takes our past. And as hard as this is, is, this is where the real freedom comes in. No matter what has happened, seriously, in the area of sexuality or any sin, really, for that matter, whatever, the failure and the mistakes, whether that was yesterday or five years ago, we have all made them. Guess what? Jesus actually came for your sexual sin, too. Don't isolate that. Think that that is something different. And he took it on the cross, just like he took all the other sins in our lives. Hear this. Paul says, when you were dead in your sins and the uncircumcision of your flesh, God made you alive in Christ. He forgave us all of our sins. How? Having canceled the charge of our legal indebtedness, which stood against us and condemned us. He has taken it away, nailing it to the cross. Friends, in Christ, I don't care what your past is. In Christ, there's forgiveness and there's healing from our sin. And, and so as we are convicted about this, and I hope that we are often convicted about this, because that shows us that we're taking it seriously. Confess your sin to the Lord. He already knows it. Be real with Him. And be freed from all the guilt and all the baggage and all the garbage that we just carry on because of all the junk that we've done. But friends, Jesus isn't just for our past. He'll take that. He'll take that. But guess what? He's exactly what we need for our present. Because it is in this battle, we can't fight it ourselves. Check this passage out. I just love this. Hebrews 4. For we do not have a high priest who is unable to empathize with our weakness, but we have one who has been tempted in every way, just as we are, and yet he did not sin. Now get this. Let us then approach God's throne of grace with confidence so that we may receive mercy and find grace to help us in our time of need. Friends, you have not faced anything that Jesus hasn't already faced. In fact, he probably faced it a hundred times more stronger. That doesn't make sense. And he won victory over it, which means that not only Jesus understands and all the difficulty and all the pain and all the, the seriousness of temptation, guess what? He is able to understand that and then have mercy on us and then to help us in our need. The greatest weapon that you have in your battle against this issue and sexuality, sin, is Jesus. Growing day by day in Him. Submitting ourselves under His Word and what He says. And, and receiving His grace and forgiveness every day when we mess up. And daily seeking His help and strength to fight and, and to live for Him. Jesus deals with our past and He deals with our present. We need Him. Eyes fixed on Him. Friends, the Scriptures desire us today to see that God's way is the best way. His way is the best way. Even if sometimes it's the hardest way. And yet in the midst of our struggles, Jesus is there to help us, to forgive our sins, to help make radical changes in our lives, and to give us strength to fight every day. So may you and I then, today and tomorrow and the days to come, no matter what context we're in and whatever, may, may we continually seek the Lord's way in our lives, over and against our way and our desires. And may then we seek His grace and mercy to help us in our time of need. Father, thank You for this word. Hmm. A hard word, Father. And yet a very real word. A word that really hits all of us here. Because all of us struggle in this area different ways. Different manifestations. 
And, and Lord, we are all tempted to believe lies and to uh, put things in the wrong place and then to justify ourselves to excuse ourselves, to ignore things in our lives. And yet, Lord, you, you know all that. You know all that. And you still came to love us and forgive us. Father, I pray that you would work in each of our hearts today, Lord. You know exactly what we need to hear. Lord, you know what each person here needs today. And we just invite you to do that work in our lives, Lord, exposing our own uh, sin in this area, helping us to see areas that maybe we can change in our life to do better battle and bring it all back to you, Jesus, where we find hope and forgiveness, grace, mercy, and strength to live each day and fight to honor you. In Jesus' name, amen.